We're good? All right. Hi, folks. Thanks for stopping in this afternoon. This afternoon, we're going to do a presentation on the Alaska um, Father Edward Sipple and some artifacts that his grandfather had brought home to Calvary Station and stuff like that. Um, I've known Father for eight years or so, and the whole history of Alaska has really expanded. And when I was asked to do this presentation for Fond du Lac, it ended up that I, I'm on a computer doing all this research, and you would not believe how many people from this area went to Alaska. I mean, it's really mind-boggling. So I've only got a few on here. Our focus is going to be on J.L. Bowl, which is actually Father Sipple's grandfather. So, um, and I'm going to try to have him interact as much as possible here. So, <laughs> would you like to come up and talk about just Alaska in general? And then as we go along, I'd like to introduce you to um, some rest of the family to let, uh, as we go along, there's going to be so many different avenues with this presentation because there's so many people and there's, there's Calvary Station and there's deaths and, of course, Alaska, but we're going to start you off just with the general history. A very good a little overview here. Uh, you know, the gold rush to uh, the Yukon first and then... Uh, very quickly after that, they discovered the gold at Nome, Alaska. <clears throat> and uh, those were the gay 90s, if the old folks remember that term was used uh, very frequently. That was before the word gay got a very specialized. <laughs> those were tough years, too. They had a depression at that time in 93. And some, you know, they didn't keep, well, they, they, they Financial people were keeping records like they do today, or the government either, but uh, some of the historians claim that the 1893 depression was worse than the one in the 30s. Uh, so that depression left at least 20% of the mostly men, the ladies had to be homemakers full time those years, 20% uh, of unemployment at least. You know, that drove a lot of people up to the Yukon, and uh, also a year after the Yukon broke, the stampede there, uh, the uh, news of the easier obtained gold in Nome, Alaska on the beach. Uh, when the news got out on that, the people that were <clears throat> that struggled their way, uh, many died, many got from sickness and other causes, <laughs> dangers. Uh, on their way to the Yukon, very hard to get there. Well, they were, it was easy to go with the flow of the Yukon River and uh, to get to uh, <coughs> Nome, Alaska, up the coast just a bit. And there was commercial uh, means to uh, get their gear and themselves uh, from uh, the chief points of departure from the Yukon. Uh, Skagway was one of them, I forget the other. Uh, there are many diaries and things that are in print uh, and are very interesting. Uh, the diaries that some of these people left, uh, and it speaks of their death and devastation that occurred, whether from scurvy, accidents, uh, mostly accidents, uh, cave in the mines, things like that. Uh, really, the greatest overview of this whole thing. Uh, can be the uh, book Alaska by James uh, Missioner. Uh, he died, what, about 12 years ago. Every time he was writing a book, he had a paid crew that did uh, research on his next book under his direction. So if his books are not fiction. They're, uh, uh, there's fiction in them, but they're good historical uh, fictional accounts. He starts with the... Uh, it's a big overview because he starts with the a bridge that uh, at one time joined Alaska with Siberia <clears throat> and the hunting of the mammoths, which that's fictional, of course. He wasn't, nobody can give an account of that. But uh, the evidence is there that they, they lived on the mammoths very much early on, the uh, Eskimos, as we call them now, the Inuit. <clears throat> Uh, 
the uh, I think that you have some interesting details on what uh, people had to bring <coughs> from most of them from San Francisco and more likely Seattle was the takeoff point and uh, they had to bring was it a ton? Uh, each person? Yeah, that we'll was about a, that with the next couple did, of slides. You have all the details on the, the first time I ever saw that. Yeah. Right. Okay, well that this is pretty much of an overview. I, I've got some more material, but uh, we can, that's enough for now. Yeah. We did not practice this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so just to give you an idea, a lot of the people went in at the Seaward Peninsula here, up the... Um, the Yukon, here's Nome and Teller and St. Michael and all that. So it's the majority the of them went this way or up the rivers, and here's the Yukon River to Dawson and stuff like that. So just to give you an idea of where all these people are going because everybody, oops, because everybody went different routes. It, it was quite expensive and it depended upon which way they went. This was one of the toughest ones, guys. I, I just uh, read um, one of the guys from Fond du Lac did this one and how many pounds they had to carry up and how many people had died in the storms that went through, but we'll get through that. So just a reminder, the Klondike started in 1896, okay, and then later on it was Nome that had the gold rush in 1899. So. I just found, the internet is amazing. I sit on there and I look through newspapers and stuff, but I never knew there was a book from 1897, and it was like a general guide for any gold seeker. And so it was the Chicago Records book for gold seekers. It told about every creek, every river, every boat, your supplies, what you should get, what you should do, how to doctor yourself up if you were sick. Scurvy was a big thing up there. But it was mind-boggling. I, I could have sat there till 2 o'clock in the morning and gone through this book. It's like four or 500 pages on the internet. Phenomenal. So I'm there. This is kind of what it talks about. Well, Go the ahead. The lights dim a little? The lights a little? I don't know if anybody... Oh, Mary, you are here. There you go. Great. I love it. The front ones. Can you do the front ones and leave the back ones on? There. Does that help? Yeah. 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 All right. Now I can read it too. So, um, but in this book, they had different areas that, if you left Seattle, you can buy, you know, two heavy sweaters for 10 bucks. But if you went up into the Yukon areas, and this is just one of the ports, I mean, the prices just were phenomenal. The same with buying your wood, buying, um, you know, the rest of your supplies that you need. but. Just go through and look at it. They, they basically tripled, if not quadrupled. So, um, so by the time these guys got up there, you, know, you figure your cost is like $150 to $300 to get from Chicago or New York all the way to Seattle, and then you have to deal with this. And then on top of that, you got to carry it all. You know? So this is the food that they recommended for one year's supply. Wow. And kind of, I want to point out the fattiest bacon. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then the weight here doesn't even include your housing, which is your tent and stuff like that. And then you have your cookware, you know, your kettles for coffee and all. Um, drugs, because you wanted to have your salves, and there was, uh, well, alcohol too, but a lot of your drugs were alcohol back then, I think. Um, and then all your mining tools. So, a lot of pounds. A dozen matches, though? Yeah. Uh, it was a dozen one-pound packages of oh, matches. Okay. I, I question that, too. Thank you for bringing that up. So. But we're going to come back here to Wisconsin. Calvary Station. How many of you guys remember the Bull Mercantile in no. Calvary Station? Yeah? I, I, there's a couple of hands. Oh my goodness. Well, there's a historian, Gene Brown, and his wife, Pat, who know everything about Calvary Station. So he's just done a phenomenal job about all the history. They tore it down in 19... Gene? 1974. 
okay? And I know Father just ran through this with me again, but the, the housing was where the trees are. That's where they live. And upstairs, those were hotel rooms. And then you can see there's a saloon. I have a great story about this guy who was um, murdered. It was the eve of voting, of all things, and because they must have had a little spat in there, but it was two local people here, and I don't want to mention the names, but in 1876, I came across this murder right in that saloon. Okay, so then we had the office, which was the post office for Calvary Station, um, the general store, and then there's this little building here, and it kind of housed, at one time, it housed some polar bear furs, mostly polar bear furs, because John L. Bull brought back a lot of curios and things to show the local people. And also downstairs, or was it upstairs, that he housed a lot of the artifacts? Um, it was downstairs in a little museum. Yeah. Okay, so and it was... By the way, all those uh, polar bear hides uh, became infected with vermin and they had to be burned. Okay, so all the... Yeah. And at one time there was a full-size polar bear also. I remember you talking about that. So there was quite a few curios. We'll get into what happened to everything later on down the line. Yes. This is in Calvary Station. Yep. Yep. Calvary Station is just outside of Mount Calvary. Uh, Puddleford. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Uh, what else is out there, Gene? Oh, the, the, um, the seminary is in Mount Calvary, but what's that other building? It's the Brothers School. The Brothers School, thank you. Who said that? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a school out there for the brothers. And so right between that and the road where Gene lives, if you're ever curious, call up Gene. He's got everything about Calvary Station. Phenomenal. So then we start up with Joe. Oops, hang on. I want to add something. When I was a little boy, I was born in 1922, but uh, the main entrance of the store, invariably, there was a uh, empty nail barrel. Years ago, that's how they shipped the uh, barrel. So the, the, in the empty barrel contained buggy whips of various lengths. And there must have been a big seller in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> so now this is Father Sipple's grandfather, the wedding pitcher, and his wife, Della. Okay, she came from Dundee. Uh, how many are you familiar with the mill in Dundee? Yeah, that's part of her family, so... Uh, they married in 1891. They had two beautiful children. Della is father's mom. And then there's Johnny, and I'll, I'll call him Johnny Boy. Um, John, when John was born, that's when Della died. So after childbirth, Della did die, leaving John L. Bull alone with two children. And because they ran the mercantile, there was uh, Aunt Mary, and there was Aunt Frances, who took care of the kids. And then the date when Della had died would have been 1896, and that's when John Elbow went up to Alaska. So he left the kids, yep, left the kids with the sisters and moved on. Notice the necklace around her neck, young Della's neck. It's all gold. It was a long gold chain with a solid, well not solid, it was a locket that she carried around her mom and dad's pictures. So, and Donnie, or um, Della was the, the eye in John L. Boy's. You know, when it came to Johnny, Johnny Boy, he had a lot of um, hard times with the son and he always favored the daughter tremendously. So, so I want you to look at the letterheads. Um, in 1902, he was in teller. It was uh, coal and lumbering and all that. And then by 1907, he was more into Arctic furs. 
and we'll get into that later on too, but it just went from mining to shipping to furs, and it, it just keeps going and going, never ends. But he always writes to his daughter, Della, and the whole explanation, and of course they owned the post office, all he had to write down was Della. <laughs> so, but the letterhead is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, Lincoln was an agent out of uh, uh, Seattle, so he knew him quite well. And then when they got up there, they started in St. Michael's, which is right at the port by Nome, up in that area. So they have uh, built the building. He was into coal and lumber and all that. And P.G. Abler, we'll start talking about him pretty quick. And then they did the Bull Mercantile and Teller, which is not too far away from St. Michael. And once again, P.J. Abler, he's in the middle, labeled. And here we have J.L. Bone. So he had that store, and then he, he started up the first store in Nome. So mm -hmm. that's the first building that they had. And maybe this is a good time, Frank. You want to talk about who he all had employed? Okay. Because uh, then he just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So, by the way, Wyatt Earp had a tavern two houses down <laughs> from here. So, oh, here's Father. Yes. Yeah, no, I just wanted to mention sure. something about. Uh, that's fine. I mentioned something about Frank. I wonder if he's the only one here that made a trip to Nome, Alaska, and particularly to do research there. He has ties to Calvary Station. His uh, your grandmother was a sister of John L. Bow, and so uh, uh, he's always been interested in the, uh, in the field that we're discussing. And I wonder, has anybody else ever went to Nome, Alaska? Did you do re any historical research? No, no. You bet you enjoyed it. It's great. <laughs> That's it doesn't look all that thing. different anymore. <laughs> oh, it's on my bucket list. So. So I'd like to introduce Frank Van Bree. He's from Illinois, right? Yeah, So, and part of the family and everything. But he was up there, and he's just going to briefly touch on some of the employees at the Bull Mercantile and his experiences up in Nome. Okay. Uh, as Teresa said, my name is Frank Van Bree. I'm the great-grandson of Frank Elbow, uh, father's grandfather, and my grandmother were brother and sister. And uh, I remember Calvary when it was an operating uh, concern back in the 40s because we would come up for vacations. And uh, I remember it very well being there. The railroad was still there and so forth. But I got interested in Nome. Uh, I'm going to get rid I'll tell you, I'm going to get rid of this thing if you can all hear me. No. Is that all right? No. No, it's not all right. Okay. All right. Okay. So when I went up there, uh, I found out that they have a little uh, museum up there run by the local historical society. And uh, I got in touch with them and told them who I was and that I was coming up. And so they had some material prepared for me pictures of the Bow Mercantile stores up there, and a, um, a list of people who actually worked for John L. Bow up there. And Father thought it might be kind of interesting to find out if anybody here is a, a relative or knows of these families. Uh, the Oblers, of course, they were, they were from uh, the uh, Calvary area. Um, H. L. Baldwin, he was a clerk up there. Um, Theodore Berger, now I know he was from Princeton because that's my grandfather's brother, and they were they were from Princeton. Charles Bourne, Edward Bourne, Charles Haig, I would imagine. That's my family. That's the your Bournes, family. The Bournes were actually the captain. Of the P.J. Oh, Adler, okay, very good. Um, perhaps uh, the Hardings, of course, I think uh, are also fairly well known to uh, this group. Um, John Joyce, he was listed as a watchman 
Um, don't know anything else about him. Uh, D.F. Kelly was a clerk in the store, I guess. Um, then there, were, there was a William Marks, and whether it was spelled M-A-R-K-S or M-A-R-X, they weren't sure. But I know there was a Marks who was a clerk in the store, in the Bow store at Calvary. So uh, perhaps that's, there's some connection there. There was also a fellow by the name of B. Megamire, and he, he and John L. were, uh, were business partners. Uh, Negemeyer was the, uh, uh, the treasurer, the financial man, and they were, he was particularly active once they got into the fur business. And I think he was eventually connected with Chicago, because my, I remember my grandmother uh, going to family parties and stuff with the Negemeyers. And then there was somebody else by the name of uh, Schluter, Henry Schluter, who was a cook. I would like to have known him. Um, but, uh, uh, but all these people were up there 1901 through 1905, 1907. So the historical society up there is, uh, as I say, a, a pretty good outfit. And let me show you some stuff I got from them if anybody is interested in following up on this. Um, <coughs> Well, all right, I will put it over on the table. Um, you know, Noam really has its, its greatest claim to fame as being the, um, the place where the Iditarod ends. It starts out in Anchorage and ends in Nome. And uh, they've got a lot up there about that. Uh, one, one other thing maybe that I'll mention is the, the gold find up there was literally gold that was washed down out of the hills and onto the beach. And the, uh, you know, a guy by the name of Sutter in California, and I don't know who the main guy was in, in uh, the Klondike region, but they called these three guys who found the original gold strike there is the three lucky Swedes. And if you ever go to Nome, you will find out a lot of stuff dealing with the three lucky Swedes. But evidently the town itself grew from south to north uh, because the bow stores <coughs> were down by the beach. This town today has gone much more to the north. You know, six blocks and you're in and out of Nome. It's, it's not that big. Um, and if it wasn't for the Iditarod, I, I don't think they'd be as big as they are. But um, so the, all the pictures of these stores are down at the south end of town. And Nome is subject to uh, tsunamis and fire. So a lot of stuff there is very hard to trace because it'd get washed away. There are several different pictures of the bow stores. I can kind of assume that they got washed away in tsunamis and then were rebuilt. Uh, and then the town would burn down every once in a while. There's only one tree in Nome. All the rest have been destroyed either by tsunamis or, uh, or fire. Uh, the tsunamis are, are, were so bad that actually the graveyard there, all the, the uh, coffins floated up to the surface uh, and had to be reburied. So it was not an easy place to live back in those days. And I'm not sure when you see how much it cost just to get up there, whether you ever got enough gold out of there to, um, to pay for it. They still uh, go for gold up there. You see a lot of abandoned uh, hydraulic uh, machines that would just literally blow away the hillsides with uh, streams of water, high pressure water, and then they would get the gold, a lot of it by panning. Uh, you know, wasn't walking around picking up gold nuggets on the, on the beach. You did have to work for it. Uh, and there are still, to this day, operations right on the beach with people using water pressure to wash the, uh, uh, the sediments and stuff to try and find gold. So uh, it, it continues. It may have started 100 years ago, but it's still going on. Thank you, Frank. Can I ask a question? Sure. 
Isn't that an ecological disaster, blasting away the sides of the Oh, the question was about the ecological, uh, what happens with the mining. I'm, I'm sure they have... Uh, yeah, you know, back then, who cared? And, and they, they did a lot of uh, hydraulic mining in, down here in the lower 48. But did you well, say they're still doing it? Yeah, they're not still that, doing not it. On, not on that scale. The stuff now is pretty much down on the, in the Bering Sea, where they bring their uh, machinery down, and it's in the sea. And one of those little operations wouldn't take up 10% of this room. It's, it's it's enough to to get something out of it. Certainly not enough to go commercial. All right, Father wants to sneak in here. Well, I just wanted to mention uh, there's a uh, several <clears throat> there's several shows on Alaska, and have any of you seen that? That uh, they don't have, they don't have very sizable boats, so they must and they must ply the uh, shallow waters because they. Uh, lower a, uh, a hose, a huge hose, to the, uh, uh, the bottom of the, uh, the sea, uh, the Bering Sea, and uh, then they suck the uh, water and sand up into the boat, and then they sluice it. And sluicing means you got running water with sand and gold, and you hope gold in it. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the gold is heavier, and they uh, they somehow know how to operate this, so they get most of the gold, even the fine gold, will accumulate and be separate, separate entirely from the sand and the water. And of course, that's how they did it in the beaches of uh, Nome, Alaska, but they did it at first on the beach I think that was the only time in human history where they had 30 miles of beach, mostly north of Nome, and there were tents all along that 30 miles, and most of them sluiced with a big gold pan, which Teresa has one here. Where you got that? I don't know what. And we have pictures too to show yeah. off. So, and I, I was going to mention that that uh, one other thing that is of interest, and I. I didn't include it, but uh, <clears throat> for the uh, very dangerous area of the Yukon, uh, historians only estimate. You know, they, those days, well, there wasn't the communications and there wasn't any government up there and so on, but there were 100,000 people left San Francisco and Seattle alone, and of that, uh, of 100,000 people, there were 4%, 4,000 actually extracted some gold. So that's 4,000 people. And of that 4,000 people, as Frank mentioned, a lot of them didn't even break even. And of course, some made a fortune. It's a little bit like the percentage at Las Vegas. <laughs> you read in the paper every once in a while, uh, somebody gets a jackpot on a quarter machine and it's almost a couple million bucks. Well, that about happens about every 10 years. <laughs> All right, so, and, and by the way, these photos are original to John L. Bow's photo album. So everything that's written on here is exactly what John L. Bow wrote for those pictures. So uh, down on the bottom, we have Nigemeyer, Kelly, Graham, and Lincoln. Those are the, the agents that he worked with. This is the bull mercantile vessel, vessel that they had. Um, had, that they had. I, I've tried doing research on the boats or the ships and the schooners and stuff, and it's hard. It's hard. So they had this one, uh, the Lizzie Colby, which there is a diary for, which is uh, interesting because I think at the end of this one it said, never again. <laughs> um, but and then there's PJ Abler so I have to tell you this photograph the nicer one up on top there that's when I first met up with father Gene Brown there was uh, John Brusso and his wife we were all sitting up at the Malone Museum and I never knew father and he sat down we were talking and before I knew it he popped out that picture and he says what do you think of it 
I said, I don't know. He says, take it home and find out. So I took it home, and that was like in July. And then he called me up like in October. He said, this father simple. Did you find anything? I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm always so busy. <sighs> I need to slow down. So there I was, 2 o'clock in the morning doing research, and I found a boatload of stuff, I'll tell you. So anyways, the P.J. Adler was a famous uh, schooner up in that area. It was part of the Alaskan exhibit, or not exhibit, the, the expedition with Frank Kleinschmidt. There's actually a documentary out there from 1912. Um, I just went online last night and found out that TCM, Turner Classic Movie Channel, had it on their website. So I just sent out an email asking them if there's a chance I can get a copy. So uh, they used the P.J. Abler schooner. P.J. Abler, and I'm just going to talk uh, the middle part. There's a lot about him. He was here from, um, well, he lived over in Owen, Wisconsin. He operated a store and a trade, you know, the schooner and all that between Seattle. Um, he carried a lot of hunting parties. Uh, it just goes on and on about P.J. Abler. He was a good friend of Father, or, you know, John L. Bull. So I have a lot of writing in here. I'm just going to whiz through this. So the other part of him, yeah, Mount Calvary. He worked for the railroad. Thank you. That's one thing I want to point out because all these people were connected because of the railroad. You know, that's all they had back then, the mercantile. Well, they came through the Holy Lands. They stopped at the mercantile, and that's how they got to know each other and stuff like that. So... And then, uh, let's see, oh, this was just a newspaper article about all the curios that he kept bringing home. So that was a big thing. You know, people would come to the, by railroad, stop and look at the museums and stuff like that. So 1915, the schooner burnt, and that was it. So that was it. Now, parts of Nome, during that time period, they did a lot of building. We got the courthouse, the church, the hospital. We have a school. This is actually uh, the Cape of Prince uh, of Wales, uh, which isn't that far away either. Uh, yes, dear? Go back to the picture of the church. Sure, picture of the church, Catholic church. The church is no longer the Catholic church. It's been moved about four blocks to if you want to call it a town square, and it is now a, um, well, it's like a, a community center. The new Catholic church there is probably about the size of that, uh, that building there, and the interesting part of it is part of their services are held in Inuit because there is still a, a, a for lack of a better word, Eskimo or Inuit uh, population there, but the church still exists as a civic center. Thank you. Cool. All right. The school. This is a typical gnome scene. The streets. This is August. Notice all the guys have hats on. I love that. What's a harass scene? I think, yeah, I'm not sure what the celebration was. That's just how John put it into his photo album. How many women? There were some women, and actually Frank talked about the Borns. They were part of the, uh, one of the ships up there, and uh, the wives sometimes went up there. And I'll talk about that in a little bit with uh, one of the, the Reinhardt family. Fourth of July, there's a good picture with everybody with their hats, their top hats. A bakery. I love the pictures. Here we have the post office, everybody's lined up. And if there's questions in between, just hoot and holler if I'm going too fast. So I have one speed and that's cool. All right, Charles Hay. Now he's from the town of Calumet. That's part of my family. So he married up with Emma Seifert. My grandmother's maiden name was Seifert. That was her aunt. And so Charles uh, knew you know, everybody else in the Fond du Lac area, and he was part of the John L. Bull group. So he ended up doing a lot of mining in Idaho, and that's where he stayed and died. And then we have John Lefebvre, which I thought was great. He's from uh, Marytown, 
if I'm right, Mount Calvary Cemetery. Yeah, he's in Marytown. But if you go down halfway, he's an inventor. He did, he was single, and he did a lot of patents. But this John Lefebvre, he was the inventor of the milking machine, other devices. Uh, he had the idea of milking a cow by machine. He invented and patented such a device, and it was a part of town of Calumet in Marshfield, that a cow was milked by machine for the first time in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Guess what, folks? When his invention did not find a ready market, farmers preferred to milk the cows in a traditional way. <laughs> Homer, huh? So, but uh, yeah, this was fascinating when I came across information for him. He died in 1949. And here we go. This is the picture that in the newspaper. That's John uh, Peter Abler, or Phil Abler, P.J. Abler. It's Philip. Philip Abler. Uh, next to Schmidtkoffer. Now the Schmidtkoffers were from Calvary Station also, and his dad was an assembly man. On the headstone though, and I tried blowing it up and it's not that good, but it says he's 24. Um, he was actually 22. He died of ty ty typhoid. So, okay, and he was just, um, he, he held a responsible position with the Gnome Mining Company. So he worked for the John P.J. Abler and the John Elbow Group. So I love this picture. The guys in the middle look so distinguished. So it cost a dollar to hop on that train. So and it was only seven miles long. Nice picture of gold, huh, folks? So um, they brought in a lot of gold. And some people did, some people didn't. So. This guy was in John's photo album, but we don't know the connection. So I just wanted to put that in there because, you know, to show the hardships and everything. So he was a noble mind man. So I don't know if he died in the mine. Oh, yeah, killed by cave in, in the mines. So another disheartening photo. Just typical scene of Noam. Now we get into the beaches, and this is what Frank had talked about because uh, well, the, the, that was free claim on the beaches. You didn't have to buy a claim for territory or spot. Oops. <gasps> Mary, what happened? <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to whiz through that. And those are just the typical scenes of what it looked like. All the huts, all the machinery. All the people. Mike Brerig, he was from the Marytown area. He struck a goal, uh, struck the gold, uh, and he lost it all when his steamer sank. Um, family lore had stated, "I was lucky to get out of there alive." When he got home, his sister didn't recognize him, and so he went and cleaned up. And the next morning, she finally let him into the house. <laughs> And his, he's got a grand, or great grandson. Is Mike here by any chance? Okay. Um, I met up with him when we did the exhibit for the Malone Museum. So he's got a lot of history on his great great grandfather. And then Joseph Bros, this was interesting. He was from Johnsburg. He's the guy in the middle sitting down. This was in the Naholcine Reporter, 1986. Uh, he was influenced by Dr. Bungie to go to Alaska for half of his discoveries. Um, he met up with 20 other Wisconsin men in St. Paul. They walked 12 miles a day and carried 150 pounds each. Uh, then he walked up the glacier at 350 pounds, and he had a diary. And so I just kind of pinpointed some of the funny, you know, the fine points. Just me and the dog took up 350. Um, <coughs> They climbed the glacier, all 20 of them, roughly 1,500 pounds. It got stormy. They couldn't travel. Two dip men died in the camp. One was shot, and he said he will die. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, the Wisconsin party took half, or all the goods, moved 18 tons. They ran out of wood, so they only used it for cooking, and then later on they didn't have any wood. The blizzards came in. And they couldn't even see the guys 12 feet away. Um, they were part of the first group that went up the summit. 
And then in June, it was just, you know, mosquitoes. You couldn't even write or anything like that. Then they were on a river boat. And the ri and there's so much ice on the rivers. And so the boats were swamped, and some of the boats ahead of them lost everything to the river. And so they, they would pull the boats up through the ice and all that, and they finally found copper, or gold in the copper area. And most of the guys went back home, but uh, Joseph Bro stuck around. And he actually built this little cabin there and stuff. He never came back to the United States. And he lived in Fairbanks, died up there at the age of 74. So now Frank had talked about the storms. So I have before and after pictures, the devastation of what happens. And I'm going to move away from the camera here. You can see the boat here, and you can see the saloon here. And then this is where the boat ended up, and here's that one saloon. Just to give you an idea, and of course all the tents are pretty much gone. Uh, there's that saloon again. And this is just one of many of the storms that happen up there. So the ships, they were tossed, turned, and lost. And, uh, you know, that, that Mike Rarig, you know, you just lose everything, so... And then Joseph Reinhardt, is Tracy Reinhardt here? I didn't see her. She has an amazing story on her side of the family, Dodieville. Uh, they got all scurvy so bad and they starved and there was a ship and that's where the Bourne family comes in. Uh, great story, you can look it up on the internet. So, in Dutch Harbor, so this is part of the shipping and stuff. Um, a lot of ships went up that way, look at that. Whale ships. They were so close to Russia. That's where they ended up, you know, with the fur trading. A lot to do with Russia they had. And the lightering, that's when, you know, they would get off the boats and stuff. You Here you can see a lot of damage yet. Joseph Isaac is from Fond du Lac here. I know I had a lot of Holy Land people, but there was an article in 1899 about Joseph Isaacs. And he went with King Wright Plank. And then he talked about Mr. Walker, the barber. I couldn't find nothing on him. Pat McHugh, George Ernst is actually from St. Cloud. And that was his brother-in-law. Um, they went to Dawson. They purchased a couple of claims. Um, they found $900 in gold. King got scurvy, but he was able to pull through it six weeks later. Uh, we did not experience any of the hardships that a great many of gold hunters experienced. So, and at no time were they short on rations. So they did pretty good. Let's see here. Oh, and this is where the marks comes in, Frank. You had talked about marks on the bottom. There was another article in 1900 that talked about Isaac Fox, Miller, Flynn, Marks, and others. So I'm wondering if that marks falls into that. I did find Silas Wright. He's actually from Plymouth, but that's where the railroad comes in again. So I'm sure there was something in Plymouth that brought him and met up with you know some of the other, other Wisconsin and Fond du Lac people. So, but I, I love the photo. <laughs> I just have to throw him in there. And then we have Thomas Keel, who was actually from Fond du Lac. He was an ex, or well, he was the sheriff in Fond du Lac here. Uh, not too much other history about him besides that he was an alderman, I do believe, or assemblyman. Yeah, so I couldn't find, he's, he's buried in Calvary Cemetery here in Fond du Lac. So I, I'm not quite sure how extensive he was up in Alaska, but he did go to Fairbanks with the mining. So, um... Alaska's got all the walrus and all that, and there are some artifacts over there, and we'll show you them later. And here we have all the reindeer that were typical up there. Mm. Typical housing for the Eskimos. Typical native boats. I'd love to get one of those coats. <laughs> and then the kids. Now, John L. Bull 
Mikaninis, which are their babies, which is a neat word. And then Eskimo, how he spelled Eskimo is up there. So. And I think that one picture, yeah, this one, they were, you know, adapting to our clothing and stuff like that. And the kids. Notice in the background the fish. And we'll be getting into that in a little bit here. It's called Tom Cod, and they dry it. And you can see the umiak in the back, the boat. So up there they had all the dog sleds. That's what the tom cod was for. They would dry the tom cod, and that's what how, how they fed the sled dogs. This lady here, she's in the fur coat. That's Carrie Beaton um, in Nome, and she made quite a lot of money just feeding all the dogs and with the tom cod. And that was a, that was like the Grand Central Station uh, as far as transportation. So a lot of people went to her. Pretty amazing picture, huh? Mm -hmm. She was the inspiration for a lot of Rex Beach's books. So any of those older books by Jack London and stuff like that, you, you get the whole picture of what these guys went through, you know, father's uh, grandfather. And she did all the Tom Cod. John L. Bull, I want to get back to him. Am I missing anything? Mr. Brown, can you think of anything, Frank? Okay, and I, I'd also like to introduce in the corner here, this is Greg Bull, and he also comes on Father's line, or the, you know everybody's line here. He's here to help out also from Pebbles. So John L. Bull, when he came back, his, his grandfather, when, when did his dad die? 1929? No. About the time, you mean Frank, Frank Bull. Oh, they all died in 1927 when I was, uh, I was pushing, in 1928, I was pushing five years Do you old. remember when your great-great-grandfather passed, Frank? Okay. Well, Frank Bo, uh, you know, the, the kingpin of, of Calvary, he died in 1910. Thank you. 1910 is when John L. Bo's dad died. And then John L. Bo took over the whole mercantile and everything. He was pretty pro quite prominent. Um, he was very into, you know, civic stuff. Uh, he was uh, the farm up in Calvary. He was the president, a director of the Commercial National Bank of Fond du Lac. The Calvary Canning Company did a lot for the Council of Defense and all that. Very prominent, trustworthy guy and everything. Um, so he died back in 1927, leaving his two children behind. Um, by the way, I have a piece of ivory over there with a picture of his son on one side and the, his daughter, Della, on the other side. So you'd like to check that out. So um, this, is, this is where Frank comes in with the burger. And this is where Eugene Brown comes in with the brown. And then where do you come in? <laughs> oh my goodness, so Greg's father had the tavern across the street from the original tavern, so it was competition, so, um, yeah. Father, did you want to talk about the ending of John L's estate and all that? <laughs> this is what yeah. happened after John L. Bull died. So. Uh, it's interesting, uh, he died just before, <coughs> two years before the crash in 1929, and uh, the estate was not settled until, two, until uh, 1933, so Ooh. it was uh, six years, or five years after his death that the estate was finally settled, and it was a bankruptcy. Now, I blame it all on General Ford, uh, on uh, uh, the Ford motor car. <laughs> you know that uh, they complain today about Walmart putting out a lot of, putting mom and pa businesses out of, uh, they put them out of business and so on. Well, this has been going on for a long time. 
the Sears Roebuck catalog and the Ford Motor Company put all the general stores out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and they were a kind of monopoly. When I was a little kid, uh, my brother and I would go with the folks and uh, look over the general view. And, it was, and looking back on it, it was rather amazing. The general stores that were on the railroad were at an advantage. They had to have the telegraph office, of course. And they got the news right away. At one time, who would, who would know first who uh, won uh, the Gene Tunney and whoever else fought in 1920? Telegraph operator. And it had been going on forever. So it was a center of uh, interesting news. And they had the freight house for passenger service on one side and freight service in the other half. And then they had corrals for cattle. They had one or two grain elevators. And uh, I never understood exactly what that was all about, but my brother and I would get in there and you'd pull on ropes, two little kids. You'd pull on ropes and the elevator, you'd be pulling like man, and it was real easy, and the elevator would move an inch at a time, <laughs> it was real slow, and it was all kind of pulleys up there. And, well, what else was there at a general store? The ice house, because the tavern had to have an ice house. You had a, a big garden, and you had to have a hotel, because uh, the drummers, that's a salesman, I looked that up, and there were several reasons why they may have been called drummers. One was they were salesmen, they drummed up business, but, <laughs> that's, the, but that's not certain. There are other uh, reasons why they might have been called drummers in those days. And they were put out of business, too, by the uh, uh, Ford Motor Company and uh, Sears and Roebuck <laughs> and Pennies, and <laughs> some others. And, uh, uh, they had to have, um, well, they did have a lumber yard, of course, and that, that's when uh, John L. Bo met Harding, the, uh, he's a lumber salesman, and they persuaded each other to go to Alaska and were associated ever after. Well, anyway, uh, they had to have a livery station that I mentioned, and uh, the hotel, of course. And uh, they had quite a number of employees. They didn't uh, have many conveniences of any kind. So uh, at the hotel, I remember they had uh, uh, the cook had to have three meals a day when they had hotel people. And well, for that, always three meals a day for the people who worked there. And. Uh, uh, Catherine was the cook, and Lizzie was the did the house cleaning and took care of the hotel, which included such unsavory things as uh, taking care of the night soil each day, each morning. Uh, and they had several men, of course, to help load freight, uh, do the garden work, uh, carry water for the cook uh, from the pump, uh, operate the tavern, had to be somebody there all the time, otherwise it'd be free beer. <laughs> so uh, all this came to an end. Well, they had a post office and a bank as well, yeah. Uh, so there's a little bit of everything. It was like a little kingdom. So, so when, when, when he died, he was bankrupt. There was there nothing was left, yeah. Yeah, so what happened to his estate? Well, uh, now, the artifacts we have here and so on, uh, my mother had those. She was uh, the principal beneficiary of the will. But there was nothing left. In those five years, it just, everything disintegrated. And many of these are, she got what was left. This was just junk <coughs> from that museum. I remember uh, on uh, those boat trips, two boat trips they had for fur, they had a taxidermist 
uh, along, always, because that was important. I know there were stuffed animals, and there was, I never forgot, I never saw or heard much about the ptarmigans. That's a, an Arctic bird. There was a stuffed ptarmigan, and I was kind of transfixed because I think it was taller than I was. So, well, it was a great place. And uh, what happened? Uh, well, my mother then was told by the, the judge, the bankruptcy judge, that if she wanted my father's personal effects, uh, the, uh, she, it would cost her $115, and I still had the receipt for that until I moved once. Well, I, when you move, you always lose something. Samuel Peeps, Peeps the diarist, said, uh, three moves are equal to one fire. Oh. <laughs> and the many moves I made, I found that to be true. So uh, that's where these artifacts came from. That's what was left. And it's interesting, I think maybe some of the more valuable things would be the tools. They're junk, as far as we're concerned. But these Eskimo people had fended for themselves, and they had no education. But they must have been learning all the time how to survive in the Arctic, and especially through the Arctic winters. Uh, in writing about explorers, I've read a couple of times uh, that experts feel that had Shackleton, for instance, in the Antarctic, and then those people who explored the Arctic, had they learned How the Eskimos survived, they wouldn't have suffered as they did. So these were clever people. And even the tools that they had, make, we'd say they're makeshift. But the wood they got, they collected at the seashore. And they must have gotten some metal to uh, flotsam, flotsam and what is that? Flotsam, jetsam. My God, finally. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, well, anyway, I, I thought there was an interesting thing what happens uh, to uh, uh, the people through financial occurrences. Uh, the. Uh, effort uh, uh, in Nome, Alaska, well, really his dad staked him to opening a general store. And uh, you saw how few people came at, who mined, uh, how few really came out ahead. Uh, for a little while on the shores of Nome, for 30 miles north of Nome, they had it real easy. I don't think that ever happened before, and certainly will never happen again. That they all got gold. And of course, many of them found that it was easy money at the saloons and the gambling places. And some also sought the company of women who were very rare. And then the rarer things are, the more expensive they are. So. Uh, many of these lucky miners, uh, they piddled it all away and went home broke. Okay, that's about it. Uh, you know, uh, that's one of all right, so at this time, and I, I'm trying to keep it at an hour because I do want to mention the artifacts. Uh, for you to look at, please don't touch or anything like that. I know um, John, right, has a question. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I noticed the pictures of the dogs, the dog sets. They're not all huskies, are they? No, they're not. Yeah, some of them are like Newfoundland dogs, a mix, and yeah, they're not all huskies. Good observant. So... Uh, is there any other questions? I know we kind of whipped through it. Yes, go ahead, sir. 
On one of the pictures, it showed a ship, and it said they did lightering. What is lightering? The question was, what is lightering? And I, I, I got to remember which picture that was. It wasn't that far back. Lightering is when they can only bring the ships up to shore for so far, and then the rest of the way they had to have these boats where they hauled everybody in. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's the process of lightering is um, a lot of the ships were so far out like that and here, you know, you see all the smaller boats bringing everybody in because the ships couldn't come in that far. So, great question. Yes, sir. For lightering, it's a flat bottom boat like uh -huh. a barge. There we go. Lightering is the flat bottom boat. So, thank you very much, sir. Um, yes, dear. What was gold actually used for? Because there probably wasn't much of a demand for jewelry back then. Mm, what was the gold used for back then? Yeah, currency. Yeah, because at that time it was so. Um, there, there's record books, and there's like a hundred thousand dollar entry in there, and that's what that one picture was of all the gold. So that's that's the currency they would get paid for that. And so now I, I need to ask my little group if there's anything that they wanted to add. Okay, because I kind of really want to stick to like an hour, and I know I started late. You, I have another question. Go ahead. Object yet they had storefronts and glass windows and all of that. Did they have to and the stuff to sell? Did they have to bring that all in by boat then from Seattle more or less? Great question. Yeah, everything came from Seattle pretty much. Uh, the question was is how how did they the stores up there like John Bull had the stores up there? How did he fill up his stores? Well, that's why he had his own ship because then it didn't cost them hardly as much as everybody else having to purchase it up there. So um, the cost of everything in Seattle was so much cheaper. JL Bull had his shipping. There was a lot of other shipping companies. Um, actually, there was a couple of mercantiles in Nome, and they all had their own shipping also. And that's how the mercantile business was able to be so successful. But then they really you know, jacked all the prices up and it was quite expensive. And the same with fuel. So, great question. Is there anybody else? Could I say something a little bit? Absolutely. My name is Louis Weiss and uh, my relation all lived in Dodyville. And I see the Isaacs are there and my aunt France, which Father Simple probably knows who, there was two aunts, old women that were connected with Isaacs. I can't remember France, her first name was France, and she either was a Schaefer or a Craver. And when, when they turned the gold in, they took the gold in the Dodyville or into the bag with suitcases. And I believe this is where it came from. Ah, see, I love how stories come out. You know, all the wheels are <laughs> my turning. Dad, my dad said, you know. Okay. My dad grew up out there and everything. My mother did too, so. Well, that's a great little story. I'd like to document that with the rest of the history here. I can't here. remember what France is. On France, I knew it was on France, and then they were two stuck together, and they were connected with Isaacs. But even the story about you know all the gold in a suitcase and taking it to the banks. Um, I'm, I'm a dear friend. I have a really good friend, the Langenfelds, um, who, who, well, Todd just passed away last July. His grandfather was Adolf Langenfeld in the Holstein area, and there was quite a bit and that ties in with the bros, but all the stories keep going and going like that. So, and sometimes even if you think a story, it, it, once you start doing the research, it all kind of ties in together. And then you get addicted, like I did, and like Jean did, and Frank did, and Craig and Father. It's, it's very addicting. So, and um, I don't know if, it, if anybody's got any other questions and stuff. Um, oops, I think I'm going backwards. Uh, I know a lot of you know Father, and he's around. I, I'm out at the Little Farmer, and so during the open season, oops, you're more than welcome to stop in if you have any questions or any other contributions, you know, local history, and I think Father's got one more thing to say. Yeah, not a big thing, but um, I think most of you have heard of uh, Rex Beach. He was an author. 
that spent time in Alaska, had direct experience there, and he wrote, uh, what's the famous uh, one about the, the German shepherd? White Fang. White Fang and another one. Call of the Wild. And then one that never was so popular, but very factual, uh, The Spoilers. And that was a book, of, what's the lady's name again? Uh, Carrie Beaton. Uh, uh, Carrie Beaton inspired uh, one of the principal characters <laughs> in that book, The Spoilers. And, and the, the reason that it's uh, interesting, I think, you know, there were uh, an awful lot of con men went up to mine gold in Alaska without ever getting their feet dirty. And the most famous of them was in the Skagway area, in the Yukon. And he got, he made a lot of money, but after two years he died in an exchange of gunfire, which is the happy ending of that story. <laughs> and there were uh, judges that became famous because they too were swindlers. Uh, they worked in cahoots with the claim jumpers. Now, if you jumped a claim, and then it was disputed, all you had to do was pay off the judge, and now it was your claim. And they finally established a federal court there after some years, uh, some very uh, unsatisfactory years, and the federal court finally did have the power of enforcement, which uh, hadn't even existed, but as you know, judges can do about anything. They have the last word, so there were huge shenanigans, and they're explained, and the only book I know of in that book, uh, Spoilers by Rex Beach. Great movie, too. So, all right, thank you very much, folks, and if you'd like to check out the artifact, and we have a couple of people here that will answer questions, so thank you. Some of the spearing that the natives had had, and here's uh, walrus tusks. We have some of the fishing lures that are with the bones and stone. And then we have some harpoons that have the ivory on there. Here we have gold from the shores of Nome. This is actually whale spleen that they would carve out. Uh, this is actually Father Sipple's mother, Della. And then on the other side is Father Sipple's uncle, Johnny Boy. So this actually is from John Elbow, our key person tonight. And so this is Scrimshaw that they would do. And this is a map of the city. Uh, Bet, what is it, Beto? Beto? And we have some opium pipes and other pipes from Russia because it was right up there. Here, things. Sewing needle. And these are combs. And this is a bola. And that's made of ivy and this is a, a ivy, ivory. And this is all braided, and that you'd swing around to catch the birds and stuff like that. So we have a couple of baskets. We have the smaller buttons. Everything. These are all carved out teeth, mostly. Yeah, these are buttons, and these are teeth that are made into buttons. And then we have some native tools for cutting and for like cutting the scraping the fat off of the hides, things like that. Father, what was this again? That yeah. He just explained. i got to remember how to uh, do that. Yeah, that's a, this you put in your mouth. It, the, right. And then, uh, yeah, you. And then there's a string. Is there, oh, the leather is Yeah, broken. the leather is broken, but yeah. you put this in your mouth, and then you put this in, there we go. Yeah, right? it's like the Boy Scouts start this a fire that way. Yeah, one. and then you and rub then it back. This, uh, this thing is curved around there and attached here, and that makes it spin. And then you drill with that. That's how they get their holes. Yeah, and these are uh, two drill other. Bits. There's a fine it's drill, a medium drill, and that's a heavy drill. Yeah. Isn't that funny? So then uh, the natives up there with all the people coming up would, oh, here's a little mole trap. The natives would make curios like this for all the visitors that were coming and for all the miners. So these are curios that the natives would make and sell to everybody that stopped up there. And then uh, this was added to the collection. That's one of the pan 
for panning gold. And then here I just have letterheads from J.L. Bow, our key person, because he always wrote home to his two children back in Calvary Station. Oh, really? So that's the, the 